surveys. I am a VA accredited agent, which does not mean that I work for the VA. Very similar to being a CPA, but not working for the IRS. Um, and <clears throat> I've been doing this for about eight years now. The 80% figure that Arthur was referring to, that is, uh, I came up with that figure by looking through the data that the VA put out in November of 2012 and looking at Census Bureau information. And um, what I came up with is that about 80% of the people in assisted living are veterans or surviving spouses of veterans. And then a large chain that is a client of Elder Resource Benefits Consulting didn't believe it. They were like, no, we don't think that's true. So they had um, their folks track it for two months. Every single person that called, they said, are you a veteran or surviving spouse of a veteran? It turned out to be 83%. So I was like, woo. My economics background paid off. I was able to read those Census Bureau uh, statistics correctly. All right, so the benefit we're going to be talking about is the VA's basic pension with aid and attendance. This is a benefit for, and it's a non-service connected benefit, which means you don't have to have been injured in the service, and it's a benefit for veterans who served at least one day during a period of war, at least 90 days in total, and were other than dishonorably discharged. And the reason that we say other than dishonorably discharged is to make sure that you understand you can be medically discharged. Lots of times you can also have a bad conduct discharge, particularly for women, because something that might have been a bad conduct discharge in World War II, like not being married and getting pregnant, is not going to stop you from being able to get these benefits today, even though, you know, for the last 60 years they may have been thinking that they can't get them. So, and it's called basic pension with aid and attendance. Aid and attendance is a medical rating that you have to pass to get the extra money associated with aid and attendance. And aid and attendance means that you need the assistance of another person. And we'll go into that in a, a little bit later. This is a tax-free benefit, and it's been around since the early 50s. So, Patty, excuse me, yep. can you get the basic benefit even if you do not require aid yes, and attendance? Yes, you can. So everybody's eligible for that. Well, right? yes, but the deal is, is this is really a, um, a means-based program that's meant to keep um, veterans and surviving spouses off of welfare, what you know used to be called welfare, longer than the person who didn't serve. So the basic pension level of this is, is very low. I don't have those numbers memorized, but like for the surviving spouse, 1,113 is basic pension plus the aid and attendance adder. And I know the aid and attendance adder is $416. Okay, so basic pension, let's just, you know, round and say it's about $700. So in order to get it, your monthly income would have to be below $700. Okay, so that's why we really don't spend a lot of time on that pension because most people aren't there. Because you're not there, right. Right, but this pension is different once you get this aid and attendance level. So surviving spouse up to 1,113, a single veteran up to 1,732, a veteran who himself is well, meaning he doesn't meet the criteria for aid and attendance, but his wife does. That's really the basic pension for um, a married veteran, can, um, can receive up to $1,360 a month, and a married veteran where the veteran himself needs care can get up to $2,054 a month. So these are pretty big numbers. So as you can imagine, with these type of numbers, the criteria around it can uh, be significant. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the criteria step by step. I'm going to build your knowledge so that by the time you leave here, you really understand how it works. Um, what I like to say is, <clears throat> if you don't qualify for this pension today because you're too healthy or too wealthy, do not be sad because who wants to be sicker or poorer? Nobody. 
but it's important for you to understand the criteria so that if you do eventually qualify for it, you know to apply for it, and you also will have enough knowledge in your head to say to somebody who may be struggling, who maybe should be living in assisted living or maybe should be receiving home care and thinks they can't afford it, you'll be able to say, you know what, you, you got to check into the fact that your husband was a veteran or, you know, you're a veteran, you have to check into this. I get that call a lot. You know, a friend of mine saw your, your speech and asked me to call you, so that's always nice. Okay, the first criteria to get off the starting blocks is what is a wartime veteran? So again, you have to have served at least one day and been other than dishonorably discharged. And one of my favorite things to point out is World War II from December 7th, 1941 to December 31st, 1946. A lot of people who served during World War II Things, think that it ended December 31st of 45, but the year of peacekeeping counts. And for somebody who is eligible for this benefit and went in in April of 46, that's very important information. Because you don't have to have served overseas for the period. You do time. not. You could have been um, in the service right here in Tisbury, never left the island, as long as it was one day during a period of war. My husband and I actually spent the day over in Edgartown, and we saw the um, war memorial, and we were really surprised the amount of people who served in World War II from the island. You know, it looked like there were probably about 100 people listed there, like 80 to 100. It was a lot. I was kind of surprised. I was also surprised few of them in you, the You can uh, see she came over to do, like, research before yeah. she came, right? <laughs> it's funny, the thing, you know, when you, when you spend all your time doing one thing, it's funny the things that pique your interest. So um, same with Korea. The end of the Korean War is a little bit longer than a Korean War vet might think. Um, Vietnam is the only one that has a little bit where you have to have served in the country of Vietnam. Okay? Generally, you never have to leave the United States. But we have this little bit of time, February 28, 1961 through August 4th of 1964, where we were pretending we weren't there. So if you can prove that you were there, that you were off the shores of Vietnam or were boots on the ground is what they call it, or in country of Vietnam, then that counts. But for anybody from August 5th of 64 through May 7th of 1975, even again if they never left the island, they would still be considered a wartime veteran eligible for this benefit. You have to serve at least a um, minimum of 90 days and minimum of two years for the Persian Gulf War through today. Okay. So if you meet that criteria, then you are uh, a wartime veteran, and you meet that criteria for this pension. So who's the surviving spouse of a veteran? You have to have been married to a veteran who met that criteria at the time of his death. Okay? If you were divorced from him when he died, then the VA does not consider you his surviving spouse. They consider you his ex-wife, and there are no benefits for you under this program. Okay? And I'm speaking only about this program. So, and for the most part, you cannot have remarried. And the reason I say for the most part is the you cannot have remarried law went into effect on November 1st, 1990. So if you were married to a veteran and he passed away in the 60s and you married somebody else and they passed away, thank goodness, on October 31st, 1990, you can go back to your first husband's benefits. Okay, but if he passed away November 2nd, 1990, no soup for you, okay? Unless that second husband was a veteran, all right? Does that make sense? And you have to have been married to him for at least one year prior to his death. Because in the 60s, we had a lot of nurses marrying World War I veterans who were passing away. And so they had to come up with a law, uh-uh-uh, have to have been married for at least one year. Okay, the medical requirement, which the VA calls aid and attendance. And it really means, do you need the aid and attendance of another person? So does somebody have to um, do a standby assist when you're showering? Does somebody, um, you know, can you no longer really prepare your own meals? You know, you have to be what the VA calls disabled. Right, which is really difficult for a lot of seniors to come to grips with because they're like, I'm not disabled. Well, you know, you're using a wheelchair and, you know, someone's coming and making sure that you're safe when you're in the shower. That meets the definition of being disabled, right? If you um, are diabetic and have to have somebody, you know, check your insulin and help you with your shot, you know, that's going to be um, something there. 
The requirement to be able to deduct your home care expenses is a lower threshold than the aid in attendance to be able to deduct, to deduct your assisted living costs. So for home care, we generally like to see at least one activity of daily living that you need help with. And I like to say if there are social workers, doctors, nurses in the room who think they know what an activity of daily living is, you kind of have to throw that out the window because the VA is interested in the story. Why is it unsafe for this person to live alone at home with absolutely no supportive services? So um, like I had a, a lady who was living in assisted living and now she's fine. But, and you know, that was the answer. She's fine, she's fine. And I'm like, but she wouldn't have moved into assisted living if she was fine. So tell me what was going on that precipitated the move into assisted living. Oh, well, I went over to her house and she was on the floor in the kitchen. And you know, we called 911 and then we found out she'd taken her pills and put them into a candy jar and had, you know, eaten a couple of pills like they're candy. I'm like, oh, you know, that's not fine. That's will in, in, eat inappropriate things and will overdose if left alone with her medication. So um, just because now that you're receiving the help, you're fine, doesn't mean that you don't actually you know, meet the criteria. Okay, so this is where um, it becomes a little complicated. So we're gonna use some easy examples. So if I were to ask you guys what's income, most of you would say social security, your pension checks, dividends, interest. Um, you might say, some people forget to say, but you should say distributions from your IRA because they've never been taxed, okay? And we would all agree that, you know, pretty much everything that gets disclosed on your um, income taxes is going to be income plus any tax-free interest you receive on bonds. The VA doesn't necessarily care if it's taxable. They care if it's income. And we would all agree, okay, that's, that's income. And then I would tell you, that's not income for VA purposes. And this is the most important thing that you're going to take away from this meeting today, is that income for VA purposes, and they've got an acronym, so you know it's true, IVAP, IVAP, income for VA purposes. And it's income minus regularly occurring unreimbursed medical expenses as long as you meet the criteria for aid and attendance. Now, why did they call it regularly occurring unreimbursed medical expenses? As far as I can tell, it's because they couldn't think of anything that had more syllables, right? It just basically means you're paying for a medical expense, including assisted living or home care, and nobody's reimbursing you for it. Your insurance company's not covering it. You're out of pocket for this money, okay? 